Joan holds a very special place in environmental studies because, well, she started it. Um, she was one of many people on the campus who in the 1990s began working on figuring out how to turn environmental studies into a, a major. At first it was a minor and then a major. And um, the, the program that you enjoy today has her fingerprints all over it. Um, Joan retired from the university uh, about six years ago, and yet she didn't retire because she kind of timed out. She retired because instead she was ready to start the next phase of her life. And we are thrilled to have her be able to come back today and share with you what's been happening in those six years since. Uh, she's published numerous books, started a non-governmental organization, the Old Growth Forest Network, so much. And so without further ado, let's turn it over and welcome home Dr. Joan Maloof. Thank you so much, Mike. And um, I'm going to use my teacher voice because there's no microphone, but if at some point I get quiet, you can, I guess. And I'll speak up. So I think I must have been born loving plants. That's all I can figure out. You know, I have memories of being four years old and crawling across our sub suburban lawn looking for four-leaf clovers and just being amazed to watch uh, the bud of a, a flower open over the days. And so as someone that loves plants, how I expressed that in my life when I went to university was by becoming a scientist. And that's how it took that form for me. And here I am working on my master's degree, measuring the photosynthesis rate of hibiscus mishudos, a marsh, marsh plant. And I'm looking down at this uh, computer monitor and I'm actually watching the carbon dioxide levels in the chamber drop. Makes it very real what plants do for our environment when you can see how those photosynthesizing plants take up carbon from the atmosphere. Some of you students might have had the opportunity to use a machine like this in your biology labs. I know when I taught biology here, we would use this equipment called LICOR. Then for my PhD, I was still working with plants. I was branching out plant-animal interactions now, uh, studying pollinators of a rare plant. And my type of research would be published in these journals that the average person usually doesn't get to read. We used to call them the, uh, the dusty journals in the library, although hardly anybody ever goes to the library anymore to read them since they're available online now, which is great and makes it a lot easier for folks like me to access them. But still, um, they don't get a lot of readership. So I am here today really to talk about the forest because my love for plant brought me to what was happening, what is happening on our planet with the forest. So the top map here says original forest cover. We can think of that about 5,000 years ago, the dawn of civilization. The, the land was 46% covered in forest and now it is down to 31%. Why? Because of one species, and you know which species that is, and what we're doing. And that forest loss continues every year. And this is monitored by the United Nations. Every five years they come out with a report and tell us how much more forest cover we lost in the last five years. So here are the numbers. Um, from 1990 to 2015, we lost 314 million acres of forest. Right? We're losing it every year. It's just incredible. Right? We know how important the forests are for clean air, for clean water, for animal habitat. And yet somehow, collectively as a species, we don't seem to be able to do anything to slow that down or stop it. So this, this visual is pretty funny. The 1994 forest cover. So when I first got interested in this topic of the forest and losing the forest, I went to our geography department, our newly burgeoning GIS lab, and I said, you know, could you give me a, um, you know, an image that shows the forest cover now in Wicomico County, the county where we sit, and um, 
This is the graphic, which today would be a whole lot different, <laughs> a lot sharper, more realistic, but um, that gives you the idea. And then the top one, original forest cover, again, we'll say um, pre-settlement. So there were native peoples living here and they had some clearing for their crops and their villages, but it was about 95% forested. And that would have been original old forest. And then between, let's say the 1600s and now you can see how that forest cover has declined. And I put there not just how much forest, but what kind of forest, because when you look at something like that, at first you tend to think, oh, well, th this is the forest that didn't get cut, that's still there remaining. No, it all got cut. But these are the green are the places where forests could grow back. So right now, most of that green is either pine plantation or wetlands that can't be built upon, and that's why they're still green. How much of that is native forest? Very little. So this graphic tells the whole story of what's happening with our forests in one piece. So the um, top left here, this is the Pirate's Wharf Forest about 20 years ago. I'm going to be talking more about the Pirate's Wharf Forest. Has anybody heard of the Pirate's Wharf Forest in this room? Raise your hand. Yes, awesome. Okay, we're going to talk about that one. Um, so you look at that, nothing really special about it at first. You know, this, this had been a farm field that was abandoned and then the native forest returned to it because that's what happens to this land here. If you just haven't poisoned it too terribly, you can step back and eventually it's gonna become forest. So that land was abandoned farmland around the 1920s. So it's not quite a hundred years old now, a little older than that picture. And what you will have there, the larger trees are the Loblolly pines, because they're the first to come back in. They like the full sun, they're pioneer species. But there's also beech and holly and sweet gum and black gum and white oak and willow oak, southern red oak, northern red oak, black oak, hickory. I know of sassafras. Did I say dogwood? You know, they're all our native tree species that came back by themselves. Nobody planted them, nobody watered them, nobody fertilized them. And this is county land owned by Wicomico County to be park land. But what is their plan for that forest? It was to harvest it, which is pretty typical of most of the forests around here. So you see these, we'll say second or third growth forests that are these mixed species and you ride by them one week and there's a beautiful forest and you ride by the next and it's down. So these are all those same species I mentioned down. This is not a pine forest that came down. This is a mixed native hardwood forest. This is our a state forest, Maryland State Forest. And this is management as usual. And most of these places are going to be converted to pine plantations. Although the state forests now, they're getting a little bit more progressive. They're letting some oak trees in there now too. And in some cases, to prevent all the things that want to come back there, the maples, oh, I miss them, right? <laughs> the red maples and the sweet gums, um, herbicides will be sprayed to keep those things, suppress those things for the pines because the pines are worth the most money. And these pines then, will be allowed to grow for maybe 40 years and they'll be harvested and then it'll be pine again. So you end up in this cycle of going from a mixed native forest that not only supports all those different tree species, but those tree species support many different bird species, animal species, insect species, fungal species. And 
reduces the biodiversity. E.O. Wilson, how many of you know who E.O. Wilson was? Heard of him? Yes, Salisbury, good job, environmental studies. Our <laughs> most well-known conservation biologist, now up, quite getting up there in years, I think close to 90 right now, but still speaking out. He says when we convert a native forest to pine plantation, we lose 95% of the biodiversity. So here I am, a ecologist, watching this happen, a scientist wondering what can I do to make a difference? Can I publish another study in ecology that says that this is a bad idea? Is that really gonna make a difference? Why do I even care? because we're in a biodiversity crisis on this planet. In addition to losing the forest, we are losing biodiversity of all sorts. How many of you have heard of the Living Planet Index? So this is produced by the World Wildlife Fund. They said, how do we measure biodiversity? How can we say we're losing biodiversity? And what they did, they said, we'll call 1970 100% biodiversity. And I was around in 90, 1970, and it was not 100% biodiversity. We'd already lost a lot. But what they did, they said, for just the sake of argument, we'll call that 100%. And then we'll check in every year with these scientists that are studying <coughs> spotted turtles or newts or bluegills or you know, whatever they're studying and say, how are your, how's your organism doing? How are your populations doing? And the scientists would report in. And here's what they're reporting in. So instead of doing another scientific study, I thought I will try to take the studies that have already been done that shows how these organisms all depend on each other, that shows that when you cut the trees, you're not just losing trees, you're losing lots of different things, and put that into a form that the general populace could read, including the foresters. That was really one of my target audiences. I wanted them to understand what was happening. And not that there's anything wrong with pine plantations or with logging, but my point is that not all forests should be looked at as a source of wood. Not all forests necessarily should be looked at um, as a place to grow fiber, that some of our forests should be left as refuges of biodiversity and beauty for humans too. So this is the story I was trying to get across in that book. And the first chapter was called Old Growth Air, and I know some of you have, have read this book, the students. And I sought out the closest old growth forest to me. So old growth forest is a forest that's never been logged, or it hasn't been logged in so long that you can't tell that the, or it hasn't been disturbed by humans in such a long time that the forest is going through its natural cycles of birth and death and species replacement. So an um, old growth forest in this region will have very large trees. So the old growth forest that I could find closest to us was Schoolhouse Woods in Y Island. It's about 60 miles from here. But I didn't tell where the forest was in the book. I just told about breathing the air in the forest and how that air, according to the Japanese researchers, was reducing blood pressure, was reducing blood sugar, um, was reducing stress hormones, was making us more focused. And who knows, we haven't proven this yet, but just sort of elating the mood. You, know, you walk through this forest and you're breathing in these chemicals. They're going in your lungs, they're going in your bloodstream. They are affecting our bodies. And I was still teaching here when I wrote this, and people would come up to me and say, oh, I, I like your book, but can you tell me where that forest is? I really want to go to that forest. And I heard this so often that I realized 
that we needed a book that could tell people how to get to these ancient forests. And that became the next book, Among the Ancients, Adventures in the Eastern Old Growth Forest. So I went to one old growth forest in each of the states east of the Mississippi. As everybody knows, there's sequoias and redwoods out there, and we know how to get to them if we want to visit them. And how many of you have been to the, see the old growth sequoias and redwoods? Yeah, but not that many people know where the old growth is in the east. And in fact, it wasn't until 1992 that we even had a survey done. And this wasn't a government survey or an academic survey. This was just one woman picking up her phone, calling every state, talking to all the biologists, trying to piece together how much was left. That was Mary Bird Davis. And she was able to come up with a figure for how much we have left. And it is less than 1%. So it's minuscule forests that have not been cut, but they exist, these little pieces of them in every state. And that's what I wanted to let people know, because <coughs> if you can get into that forest and you can see that, you understand what a forest can be. And I think when you really understand what a forest can be, it will encourage you to speak out and make sure that they get to be what they can be. And if you don't understand that, why would you ever fight for that? So this, this is my feeling about the forest. You know, what was right here in this spot where, where we are right now? This was an old growth forest. This had giant oaks and beech and gums right here. So we need to understand our land. So these little pockets of old growth are places where you can understand it. This, these maps were made in 1925 by the first head of the US Forest Service. Um, shows area of virgin forests. That's what they used to be called, virgin forests. Some people now, besides old growth, use the term primary forests, or original forests, or ancient forests. There's kind of messy terminology here. I don't like to get into the displaying the hairs, but where are the old forests? And the white area, no forests because they're prairies or deserts. And then this is what the virgin forests looked like in 1850. We've been cutting pretty furiously then. And as technology improved, you know, as, as steam engines came in and trains, we just cut faster and faster and faster because we continued to lose old growth forests every decade. They continued to be cut through the 30s, 40s, 50s. So every time there was a war too, that was another excuse to open up these last remaining forests, 60s, 70s, 80s. Even today, some ancient forests being cut. It's slowed down. Well, there's not that much left. But there weren't that many people saying, or that I could find out about, doesn't look in evidence saying, let's slow this down. This is a bad idea. Let's save some more. This is um, just a photo I threw in from Maryland's Appalachian region. So this is Western Maryland, 1910. This had to be a really depressing time to be alive if you're a tree lover because you were watching the original forest being logged out and logged very quickly. And this was not just somebody you know, with a log cabin clear in their yard for a farm. This was, these were industries moving through, taking everything, moving out, not replanting, not caring. And the forest cover then, in 1910, was lower than it is today. Now, some places have recovered. You saw like the Pirate's Wharf Forest, that had been cleared of original forest, and now it's recovered, at least forest cover. So, so folks watch, the, uh, watch it go from old growth to very little growth, very low cover. So looking at these statistics and numbers and the landscape, I would think 
Why didn't more people fight to save these pieces of parts? Can you imagine if there was a 200 acre piece of old growth in this county, in this town, something you could you know, get to on your bicycle? Can you imagine how popular and wonderful that would be? Seems like it wouldn't be that hard, but it wasn't done. And I kept wanting to blame the folks in the past. Why didn't they do more? Why didn't they do more? Why didn't they do more? And then I realized that it's still happening. These second growth forests that could recover and be old are being cut right in front of me. And the old growth forest, other places. So I started looking here, and we were talking about Julia Butterfly Hill earlier. That's what she said. She came here to the campus and she said, when you're blaming somebody like that, three fingers are pointing back at you. So it's like, what part do I play in this? What can I do now? What can I do to um, reverse this? And part of the solution is, to, is education of the next generation. Because unless the next generation understands what we're losing and understands what the forest can be, they're not gonna fight for the forest. So we can preserve all the forests we want right now, and then when we're gone and they're in charge, the forests are just gonna come down. So it has to be simultaneous. We have to save forests and a generation of people to protect the forest at the same time. But how are they going to care about the forest if they never get to see the old forest? If all they see are pine plantations, that's that might not engender the same care, love, and respect. So I thought, what if we had one forest in each county that was never going to be logged again, and that was open to the public? Then no child would be, or no person would be too far from that forest. And this would be something that we could measure. Instead of just saying, save the forest, save the forest, we could say, OK, one in each county. County, where's your forest that's never going to be cut again that people can see and build a relationship to? And that thought became the Old Growth Forest Network. And I went home and Googled counties in the US. I had no idea. And this came up, I was like, oh no. <laughs> that looks like a big project. <laughs> it looks like something that I certainly can't do alone. I certainly didn't have the private resources to be able to do it. But we could start, right? How do we start? Um, well, for one, to get the resources, we would need to become a well, not independently wealthy. So somebody could have um, independently funded this, or the government could have funded it. That didn't happen. But instead, we formed a 501c3 organization, charitable organization, to called the Old Growth Forest Network to com complete this mission. We need a board of directors. You need the bylaws. You need all that work. Even then, even with myself and a board, it's too much work for all of us. So the other thing we do is recruit volunteers in each county. And that volunteer's job is to look around in their county for a forest <coughs> that could go in the old growth forest network. So sometimes, rarely, but sometimes, there is an old growth forest in a county. And sometimes that forest is already protected. And then we can say, great, this is the forest that's going to go in the old growth forest network. Sometimes there's old forests and they're not protected. And we can say, this is a job for the old growth forest network. And we can work with that owner, whether it's state, city, county, nonprofit, land trust, summer camp, and try to get that forest protected. And some places, there's no forests protected from logging and open to the public. And then we look around and say, what can we do here? And just 
some towns, their last forests are being cut. And, and they come to us and say, help us. This forest, we want to preserve this forest, but it's owned by a developer, on and on. I'm going to share some of these stories. So this is the mission of the Old Growth Forest Network. Here are our, the one person in each county. We call them our county coordinators. These are our volunteers in Maryland so far. And some of these already have their forests in the network, and some don't. This for every, this is national, so for every state I have a spreadsheet of the counties and I take suggestions from people. So these are my suggestions in Maryland. The ones in green are already in the network. The one in yellow there has just recently been added. That was next in line. The ones in red I'm interested in putting in, but they're not protected from logging. So we're working on that. <clears throat> After we can put all the pieces together, protected from logging, open to the public, relatively accessible, then we have a dedication celebration to dedicate that forest into the network. And then we put the information on our website so everybody can connect with that forest. They can know where that forest is. So Maryland Forest already in the network. And they are on our website. So if you're saying, oh, where's that forest? I want to go to that forest. You go to oldgrowthforest.net. And there's that link there for Forrest. Will, who made the website's going, oh, this is an old version. But <laughs> and you click on the Forrest, and it lists the dedicated Forrest by state, and then by county. And you click on that, and it'll give full directions for how to get there, all the other information you need. Right now, we have, so we've been at this for five years. We have. 66 forests in the Old Growth Forest Network in 17 different states. And we're going strong. But that's not the end of our mission. Because as we started doing this work, we saw some other things that were happening. And one thing we noticed is that um, lots of times you look at a map and it'll show things in green, protected, protected, protected. Like this forest here, if you look at a map, it'll show as protected. This is Schoolhouse Woods. This is the old growth forest that I went to that I talked about in <coughs> teaching the trees. And it is managed by the Maryland State Park System. But guess what? This forest can't be in the old growth forest network because it is not protected from logging. Maryland State Parks are not protected from logging. So right now, nobody's logging our parks, but that could easily change. It might not change next year, or it might. <coughs> Odds are in the next 50 years, there'll be some governor comes along and says, we need the income from these forests. So one of the things we need to do is speak out for these forests that they're calling protected and make them really protected from logging. One way to do that here would be, I think in Maryland, what we'd have to do is introduce a bill to legislature that says Maryland State Parks should be protected from logging. That's a big job. I'm not a politician. So if anybody wants to help with that, um, kind of dabbled into that and we talked about it a little bit, but um, I welcome help with that. And it would be a model for other states because the majority of states are in the same situation. Their state parks are not protected from logging. I'm not talking state forests, which this is our state forests. This is one of my students standing on a white oak stump. So this wasn't just a pine plantation that got cut. This was a mixed native forest and FSC certified by the way. So um, these are, this is what's happening in their state forests. You can see how young the, the forests are around it. But the state parks at least <coughs> should be protected. And also along these lines, lots of times when we want to put a forest in the network and we ask that question, is it protected? The owners, again, could be any entity, will say, oh yeah. And we'll say, okay, well, show us, you know, show us in writing, show us where and how it's protected from commercial logging. That's what we mean by protected. And then they start digging around and realize, oh, 
well, I guess it's not. And so this is another place where we can help draw attention to that and get it really protected. So here, these are the um, so Maryland Department of Natural Resources owns a lot, 172,000 acres on the eastern shore. Here's where you are, the eastern shore. Only 19 acres of it is old growth. That little piece up there in red is the schoolhouse woods on Y Island. And then there's like five acres in the Pocomoke um, State Park. I mean, imagine this was all covered with old growth forests original forest, and this is all that's left. There's more in Western Maryland because it's hillier and rockier over there. But, you know, I call the state parks people and say, shouldn't we protect, have a protection layer on schoolhouse woods? I mean, they won't, they, that's not even protected. That one little tiny piece left here. You know, it's just unbelievable to me. So a lot of our mission has become just education and speaking out for these places. Okay, that's state parks. What about local parks? Here's Naylor Mill Park, funded by the city of Salisbury, program open space. It's a park. It's filled with trees. It's protecting the wellhead of the primary well for the city of Salisbury. If you go out to the drinking fountain here, you're gonna be drinking paleo channel water that comes from a wellhead, you know, from here to that wall from this sign. <coughs> you think it was safe, right? You think it's protected. Excuse the bad slide, but this part's owned by the county, this part's owned by the city. The green are mountain biking trails through the beautiful forest. The county says to the city, give us this land so we can put in more ball fields. 63 acres. They're going to cut down the forest. And that was pretty much a done deal. I was told by a city council member that that was going to happen. And we started bringing people out into the forest. I mean, we're talking Atlantic white cedars. Found chestnut trees, American chestnut trees there. I mean, this is a uh, natural forest has never been completely cleared. So a small group of us got together <coughs> said this forest should not be damaged. You don't have to read this whole thing. I'm not going to read it. But what can we do? First thing we did, we made a Facebook page for it so we could communicate with each other. We started getting people out into the forest. And then we started making noise in the press. Then we started going to the city council members and saying, we want a public hearing. They put that off a long time. They kept pointing us to, the count, us to the county, saying, talk to the county, talk to the county. They're the ones that want it. We're like, no, we're talking to the city because you're the ones that own it. You're the ones that can say no. And finally, um, beautiful public hearings, and some students did come and attend that. And the, what happened was, and this was a beautiful little political thing that happened, the city council planned this ahead, that somebody would make the motion to give the forest to the county, but nobody was going to second it. So it didn't go through. And so that forest is still there today. But that could happen again, right? It could happen again in 10 years. Or it could be the next road is going to go through there. So in this case, The city's doing something really wonderful, and they are putting a conservation easement on their park. It's kind of unheard of <coughs> that you should have to put a conservation easement on your park. And it's the type of conservation easement called forever wild easement that does not allow cutting. So this will help the city to protect that park for long term. And we're actually going to have a celebration about that this spring because this is a forest that we were able to save. And 
Two days after that, by the way, I was evicted from my house that the county owned, and then they knocked it down. Um, <laughs> I don't know whether that had anything to do with uh, me snatching the forest out from under there or not. But, yeah. <laughs> So I'm going to talk to you about three forests right in this area, um, and some of these forests, students actually were given senior seminar projects. To, I went out to these forests with students, talked to them about the forest, talked to them about what was going on. Anybody here involved in the Glen Heights forest? No? Okay. So here's Salisbury. Now again, what used to be here? Forest, yes, this was all forest. This was old growth forest. There were a lot of beavers living here, right? It was swampy. We're talking 500 years ago, and then we chip, chip, chipped away at it. Um, city park up there. So here's this little piece of land here. This, and out on the table out there are these cards that if you want to be involved with the old growth forest network, please put your name and address, rip this part off, and um, you can keep the part with me hugging the tree. But if you have anything you want to communicate with me, just write it on the back of this thing with your name and address. So when I first, my very first talk ever about the Old Growth Forest Network was at Salisbury University. And it was six years ago. And this woman wrote on the back, um, please help me save a 14 acre piece of forest in Salisbury. So I went home, because if you just tell me something like that, I'm gonna forget it. <laughs> but if it's on here with your name and address, I'll follow up. So I called her up a day or two later and said, you know, I'm interested in this forest and I'll come see it. And I was pretty sure it was gonna be just, you know, your average, kind of like the Pirate's Wharf looking forest, the, 80-year-old forest here people look at as something very special and that's that's what I was expecting old forest right in the heart of town this is a place that had never been clear-cut had never been converted to farmland was it completely untouched old growth we didn't have really long enough time to study it to determine that so here's some of the trees in that forest. That's a holly tree up front. I think my hands are sycamore back there. That's an Atlantic white cedar tree, which you know most of you don't know for your tree species, but they're more and more rare around here. Very tall forest grown trees, hawks nesting in the trees, wetlands right there. And then the biodiversity. Anybody know what this is? Slime mold, probably, by serum, is my guess. Yeah, and things we don't even understand. So there's a close-up of it on the top, and here's what the developer had planned to do to it. He didn't own this little piece here. He just owned this, Bradgillis. And 92 townhomes are what was planned for that. So I went to the meetings and told the community nearby why this wasn't a good idea and I talked I got as many people interested in it as I could I talked to the la local land trust there's the director of the local land trust I said you've got to help me save this forest perfect pocket park very important for wildlife species air quality water quality it was protecting a tributary going into the river, but our land trust has never raised money to buy or protect land. They just put easements on land that, were, that people want their private land to be eased, protected, not open to the public. I talked to university professors, got them involved. I talked to DNR botanists. I talked to birders, I talked to <coughs> other land trusts. We had meetings at the city government, I talked to the mayor, and 
I just really didn't get any help. And the students came out and did a, a film about how important this forest was. <clears throat> Here's my friend Dave Wilson. He's a birder in front of Atlantic White Cedar. And this is what it looks like today. And, you know, we could raise, so what would it have taken to save this part? It was owned by a private developer. He would have sold it for 395000 which is not bad. I didn't have that much money, and I didn't have really the experience at that point of raising um, the money. That's really no excuse. You know, I could have done it if I dropped everything else and focused solely on that. That's the thing I live with now. But um, I didn't. I was involved in other things, Old Growth Forest Network, and I was living in California when I found out this happened. But the sad part of this is if there had been a community of people that cared enough about this, it wouldn't all, it wouldn't matter really where I was and what I was doing, because it takes more than one person. We gotta all get in there together. So I think there were laws broken here for forest conservation laws, but um, there it sits. Oh, here's another view of it. Oh, that pine tree we were standing in front of was cored and aged at 300 years old. And the um, oak trees, we only cored a few of them, I think 176, and some of them near 200. So, and nobody, a biological survey was never done, because you don't have to on private land. This is the third forest I want to talk about tonight. And I'll just give you the punchline right now. This one is still standing, so you don't have to. <laughs> but who knows for how long. And this was another one that was a student project. Oh, by the way, that last one when that forest was cut down, see those forests, the students that made that film, they never followed through. You know, oh, important film. Got my project done, turned in, got my grade. That's it. Not involved anymore. OK, Pirate's work. So. The house that I showed you, where I used to live, was right here, actually. <coughs> this was the address. They have this button in the wrong spot. But all of this riverfront, like Hamako River land, and all of that forest is owned by Wicomico County residents. It was purchased with Maryland program state money. <coughs> to become a park. You already saw one picture of the forest, and I already told you about it. And even though it was nothing special and kind of youngish, if you really get on Google Earth and take a close-up look at this, it might be hard to see from here, but if you look closely at all the forest, it looks like a lot of forest land. Oh, that's great. But looking closely, you'll see these stripes through it. That's thinned. When we hear that they want to thin the forest, we imagine like thinning your vegetables. It's nothing like that. It's massive machinery going down and making these like roads through the forest. So all of these forests here have these stripes through them. They are all young pine plantations. This is the oldest piece of forest there, even though it's not even that old. But, but that piece is parkland. These other forests aren't parkland. These other forests, some of them are owned by the state uh, Chesapeake forest land, state forest land, and some of them are privately owned. But they're all managed heavily as pine plantations, and this piece is on parkland. And I think parkland means a forest. So if you read Teaching the Trees, you read about my project to try to protect this forest from being logged by turning it into a September 11th Memorial Forest. In 2002, we hung tags on all the trees with the names of the victims from September 11, 2001. 
and it was close to 3,000 people that lost their lives that day, and all these trees were tagged. So this is the September 11th Memorial Forest, Public Forest, Parkland Forest, with some big old trees in there. But the county wants the original plan was to log the entire forest in sections, right? They weren't gonna do it all at once, but the whole thing was gonna be logged over time to raise money to develop the park. And then this forest would be one more pine plantation. So it's protected as forest land, but not protected. So, um, Loblolly Pine, Beach, Oak. Luckily, after making some noise, people care. It showed up at the Natural Resource Committee. I'd write things in the paper, and we got a second opinion on that. It was difficult. I mean, this was going out for bid to be logged, and we were saved because none of the foresters, the loggers, none of the loggers bid on it. That's the only way that it got saved. And now we got a second opinion by a more enlightened forester who said, maybe there's some areas in here that shouldn't be logged, like the vernal pools where the salamanders live. But still, it should be thinned. Parts of it should be thinned. And what they would do for thinning would be they'd look at this and say, oh, that oak is too crowded. It's not going to grow well. We've got to take this pine out, which is worth a lot of money, by the way, and to give the oak a chance. This is a good thing. It's good for the forest. It's healthy for the forest. And that's a mindset from growing wood. We want these trees to grow fast and thin. And I tend to disagree with that because I think I think these forests, these trees will just possibly do fine for another hundred years next to each other. And if one of them dies, so what, right? It's, it's a park and that adds to the biodiversity. In a native old forest, trees are dying all the time and new trees are coming up. So to try to educate people about this became the next part of the mission, do forests have to be managed? Right? They think this is a good thing. Manage the forest for a healthy forest. These are all forester friends in the top picture, by the way. I have left many foresters, I do understand them. The guy on the left is the only one who's not a forester. And they thought that this state forest cut was just fine. They weren't complaining about that at all. Um, so you'll hear out there, forests must be managed to be healthy. So I decided I was going to challenge that. Really? And that became my third book that just came out um, not quite a year ago. We have some out there for sale. And for this book, I just looked into those dusty journals that aren't dusty anymore because they're electronic bits and bytes. And any time there was a study where a scientist studied old unmanaged forests and compared them with the managed forests in whatever they were studying, whether it was turtles or salamanders or mosses or birds or insects or lichens, what did they find? And this is where my education to get my PhD in science really paid off because I was so used to reading those scientific papers. I enjoyed it and I could dig right into them and I could see where the interesting pieces are and what should be reported. And I was, and as a scientist, you have to be honest in what you do too, right? So I wasn't accepting only the papers that showed the side that I wanted. I was reporting honestly on what I found in this review. <coughs> and what I found was that the left alone forests accumulate more carbon. They take more carbon out of the atmosphere. 
this is, these are just different harvesting patterns. I'm not going to have time to go into all these studies in detail, but this will just kind of tease you about what I found in the book. That there are insect species only found in old growth forests, unlogged forests. So when you log them, those species are gone. There are snail species that are only found in unlogged forests. This work was done by a master's degree student in Kentucky just a few years ago. He decided to compare the snail species in the old growth forest and the managed forest. Fascinating research. Calisioid lichens, these tiny little things I'd never even heard of before. Many more species in the older forests. There are only a couple people in the country that research them, but um, they can tell the age of a forest by how many different species of these that they find. Mm -hmm. Salamander species, more species, more abundance in the old growth forest. So clear cut, this is red back salamanders, zero per acre, second growth, 96 per acre, and old growth, 488 per acre. So this is just one of the studies. Plant diversity is higher in the unmanaged forests. So we're often told when a forest gets cut, oh, it's okay, it'll recover, it'll recover, and that makes us feel better. It'll grow back, it'll recover. We have never seen full recovery of herbaceous plant diversity, ever, like even after 300 years after a forest has been cut. Um, <clears throat> to give you an example, Latin names of all these plant species on the left, um, on the left, abundance forest for old growth forest, second growth forest. And you can just, you don't even have to read this. You squint your eyes and you can see that there's more types of species and in greater abundance in the old growth forest. Which is another reason we have to save these places. How are we even going to do these studies? Researcher after researcher was complaining that you know, it's very difficult to even find places for these studies. Moss species need older forests, more mushroom species in the older native unlogged forests. So if you like mushrooms, you'll find more of them in the old forest. And we're just now learning about these fungal connections, right? the underground connections. If you like TED Talks, check out Suzanne Samard's work. And the older a tree is, the more connections that it will have to the other trees. So this, the dark green here are the larger trees, medium green, medium sized trees. This tree was connected to 47 other trees by its my fungal mycorrhizae, 11 different genets of the mycorrhizae. So we, you know, as humans can walk through a forest and go like, oh, well, you know, let's thin this a little. Let's take that one out. Well, the other trees feel it when that happens because they're sharing resources. Bird species, some bird species need older forests. When you change the structure and turn them into a pine plantation, you're not going to have a brown creeper in that forest anymore. And um, what about beauty? I actually did this research with Salisbury University students that showed that the older a forest was, the more beautiful it appeared to them. So you'll have to read the study if you're interested in the details on how that was done. Now, nothing wrong with planting trees. I plant trees, but it's very frustrating to me that it seems like all the grant money is for planting trees. You know, so look at our town. I just showed you that forest taken down. But yet then they're like, oh, let's do a project and plant trees in the town. I think first we need to protect the forest that we already have. And then maybe we can start planting trees. We're never going to be able to plant our way to an old growth forest like this Cook Forest in Pennsylvania. OK, now I'm going to, this is where my teacher, <laughs> I stuck this in just for tonight. This isn't my usual talk, but I'm a professor emeritus at Salisbury University, so I have some lessons for you students. What are my lessons? Number one, I made this job that I love. 
I'm getting a salary from doing this that I love and speaking for the trees. And we are hiring right now. We have a position open for a number two person to do this kind of work. They can work from anywhere in the country. They can work at home. They can work in their pajamas if they want to most of the time, unless it's a dedication or a talk. So it's an awesome job, but I can tell you that I'm not hiring anybody in this room. And the reason I can tell you that is because I would already know you. You would already be active with me in helping me save the forest. You would have already sought me out. We'd already be in communication. So I'm just saying that as a way, as you think ahead into the kind of work you want to do, you might want to think about starting to do it now, even if it's not you know, paid job sign on the line. Um, another one of our just stories about this, another one of our board members, past board members, he was a lawyer, University of Maryland Law School, spent all that money going to law school, worked in DC as a tax attorney, very successful, but hated it, hated his life. It was ruining his health because he just was so unhappy. He quit his job, he went to the Nature Conservancy office and he said, I don't care what you want me to do, I'll do anything. Uh, just, you know, give me something to do. I'll volunteer. In time, he ended up being the head of the Nature Conservancy for the whole state of Maryland. He ended up raising millions of dollars to protect forest land. And in fact, one of the forests in the network in Worcester County, where Holiday's the county coordinator, he raised the funds to buy that forest. There's lots of examples out there like that. So just, you know, Find your passion, do what you love, and start doing it. Don't wait for um, somebody to come to you. Uh, this one, assignments can be more than assignments. They can be doorways to ongoing involvement. Look at all those students in senior seminar in environmental student studies that went out to these forests with me, including Pirate's Wharf, heard the whole story, walked around out there, filmed out there. How many of those students are still involved in protecting those forests. None that I know of. They went, got my grade, and I'm out of here. Um, sometimes people will ask me that, well, what about working with interns with the university? It doesn't really work for me because it seems like after a semester, they're gone, and, and I'm just getting them started in their training. This one, be your own best teacher. Okay, so how many, any biology students here? Okay, yeah. You're so shy. Biology students, raise your hand. Get them up there. Or minor, biology minor major. People want to make a difference for the natural world. They want to understand the earth. Yet they're sitting in the class and it's like, uh, you know, you're learning a lot. But if you developed just one skill, one piece of biological knowledge. I'm thinking of, for instance, somebody who actually looked for the vernal pools in the forests around here. Nobody's monitoring where these vernal pools are. What <coughs> salamander species exist in those vernal pools? Nobody's doing that. Do I know anybody here that's really great at even identifying the different salamanders? I mean, one person, he's gone. So if you had that knowledge, it wouldn't be that hard for you to learn. Buy a field guide, you know, and just start getting out there. Get out there at rainy nights. Get out there mating time for the salamanders. Then you could speak out to the county as to why that forest needs to be protected because of the salamander species. Right now they can cut that forest, nobody's speaking for the salamanders. Also, if you get really good at this, you might be hired by DNR or the Nature Conservancy to survey the state for salamanders. How cool would that be? So no teacher is gonna give that to you, you're gonna to have to give that to yourself. And I kinda of did that learning rare plant species. This one, the final one, practice philanthropy. This is giving fundraising. And I say this because in my 
In my first talk at Salisbury, I had a lot of students fill out these cards. I have a lot of people everywhere fill out these cards. We call them our supporters. And once a year, we'll send out a mailing and we'll ask for donations. And I have never had a student, to my knowledge, I've never had a student send me even $20. And I know students don't have a lot of money, but if you can buy a t-shirt that says resist on it and a $5 Starbucks, you can send $20 <laughs> once a year. Yeah. To, and it doesn't have to be the Old Growth Forest Network to anything, because then it's, you're practicing it. And this is important because then if you are in this a position someday of working for a nonprofit, you might have to ask for money. And how are you going to ask for money if you haven't learned to give and share? And if we all learn this philanthropic giving, then we could do a lot to make the world a better place. Sounds really airy fairy. <laughs> and I didn't really put that in there as a plug to get money for the Old Growth Forest Network, although we exist on donations and we have donut button, donate buttons on our page and we're happy to take donations. But this, these are more life lessons for you. Don't wait until you're your parents' age to start giving. A lot of us just haven't learned this. So if you haven't learned it in your home, you're not learning in school, just teach yourself. Be your own best teacher. And so many wonderful organizations, whether it's earth-saving organizations or people-helping organizations, are looking for help for fundraising, with fundraising. So if that's a skill you can teach yourself, you can work at a cause that you really believe in. So my latest book is The Living Forest. It's out there. It's, it's just lyrical stories of the forest and when everything works right it's the happy stories how the forest does work with beautiful images and this is we don't always want to be beaten down with what's gone wrong sometimes we want to celebrate what's gone right and i hope you'll be one of the people that care about the uh forest and join the network because we got to do it together all right <laughs>